He had been a Catholic for just 34 years when Pope Leo XIII gave him the red hat of a cardinal and made him a prince of the church. And now, more than a hundred years after his death, the writings of blessed John Henry Cardinal Newman are still meticulously studied by scholars, clergy, and lay people alike. We'll talk about his life and the theology behind it tonight, so please stay with us. Welcome. Welcome, I'm Father Mitch Packwell. Welcome to EWTN Live, where we bring you guests from around the world. Before we meet our guests, I want to mention that today is Ash Wednesday, and Lent has begun. And not only today is it a day of abstaining from meat, as well as fasting for those between 14 and 60. Uh, when you're 60, you don't have to anymore. But it's also a day of abstinence every Friday in Lent. And you can do more than that, too, if you want. And by the way, abstaining from meat on Friday doesn't mean you go out for a lobster Newburgh. So it's supposed to be a time of penance. Why do we fast? Very simple. How did our first parents commit the first sin? They ate something they weren't supposed to do. Right? So... If eating is what got us into this trouble, fasting may do, be a little helpful to get us out of it. So it's good to, to do this fasting abstaining during this holy season of Lent. and It'll be a much greater celebration of Easter. All right. Today we have a guest who is a student of the life and writings of Blessed John Henry Cardinal Newman. And he's here to speak to you about how a greater understanding of Cardinal Newman's theology can have a profound impact on many of the modern challenges we see in the Catholic Church today. So please welcome the Interim Executive Director of the National Institute for Newman Studies, Dr. Kenneth L. Parker. Dr. Parker, welcome. Good to be here. Good to have you. Where, where is this institute that you're the interim director? head of? Yeah, yes, I, I, the institute is located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Great town. Yes. And uh, there's an oratory there, isn't there? There is, right across the street. Okay. Uh, because the, Blessed John Henry Newman was an oratorian priest. Correct. And, uh, and the, the oratory in Pittsburgh and the oratory in Birmingham actually have Birmingham. A, England. England, yes, yes. As here, opposed here, to Birmingham, down here in Birmingham, Birmingham, Alabama, <laughs> and over there right. is Birmingham. <laughs> That's right. Uh, uh, the uh, the uh, the two oratories, one in Birmingham, England, and and the other in in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, think of themselves as sister oratories. Okay. Uh, there, there was a there's a very close affinity uh, between the two, okay. and so in some ways. Uh, the National Institute for Newman Studies is a kind of linchpin that, that uh, brings the two oratories together in a common cause. Well, we're glad to have you here in Birmingham, Alabama, <laughs> and Good to, to talk here. about uh, a blessed who lived in Birmingham, England. And in fact, his rooms are still at the oratory. Absolutely. They've, yeah, been, they've, they've preserved. been preserved. They've been preserved. Uh, some would say they haven't been touched since uh, the cardinal uh, uh, went on to his reward. No dusting or cleaning? Uh, well, uh, I, I, I think there, there might be room for some, some uh, what, what would you call them, third order um, um, uh, relics? Uh -huh. uh, if you swept up a little bit of the dust? <laughs> yeah. Well, what is important, you know, Blessed John Henry Cardinal Newman is uh, a saint of the 1800s. Correct. And lived 
until what, what year did he die? Uh, he, was, he was born in, in 1801 and died in uh, 1890. And so that was a good long life, nearly spanning the whole century. Correct. And a, a century uh, that saw lots of changes in society and, uh, and had effects on religion as well. Tell us just a little bit about his life so that we can then understand where his teaching fits. Of course. Into context. Well, I, I, first of all, I, I think it's important to, to understand that, that Cardinal Newman uh, spent half of his life as an Anglican. Uh, he was 45 when he became a Roman Catholic, and he spent the last half of his life uh, as a Roman Catholic um, religious, priest, and theologian. Mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, he began his early life as, a, as, an, as an Anglican uh, really attached to uh, an evangelical form of Anglicanism, mm -hmm. uh, very, very strongly influenced by, by uh, Calvinist uh, Reformed theology. Yeah, and, and this would be something that would, uh, a form of Anglicanism that would not be so high church. That's correct. It would be, you know, a little bit more simple to emphasize the gospel, the, the truth of a Christian life, but not so much a high lit liturgy. That's correct. And, and, but, but also I think I would want to emphasize a, a, a a deep and profound interest and respect for uh, the nature of the liter of the of the scriptures. Yes. And yes. so, so he, he was uh, he was deeply steeped in uh, in biblical studies in, in that early part of his life. Yes. And given that uh, most Englishmen, uh, no matter what the religious belief, would study Latin and Greek in the regular course of studies. Correct. Uh, they'd read. Herodotus and the other classics oh, of uh, literature just remarkably throughout grammar school and high school. Correct. I mean, and, and also uh, during Newman's undergraduate studies, I mean, he memorized uh, many of these uh, Greek plays uh, in preparation for yeah. his, uh, his exams at the end of his three years as yeah. an undergraduate. So, so uh, in Greek. In Greek, That's yes. right. See, that's mm -hmm. one of the other things, too. He memorized it in Greek. In Greek, yes. Um, but... Then he, after being a more evangelical approach religiously and emphasizing that relationship with God and, and the uh, scriptures, he then moved in, on into Anglicanism at a very important period of Anglican history right. with the Oxford movement. Tell us about that. Well, we first have to, have to be mindful of the fact that he passed through uh, for uh, several years uh, what he would identify as a liberal phase in, in, his, uh, in his understanding of, of his uh, Anglican experience. Mm -hmm. But it was in his late, 19, 18, late 20s that he, uh, he really began to be attracted to a high church understanding of his faith. Uh, it was also a very uh, difficult time politically and socially for, for the English. Uh, there, there was a Reform Act that, uh, that brought about the toleration of both dissenters and Roman Catholics. So, Catholic, so, so folks understand, all the way until the early 1800s, right. the Catholicism was illegal. That's correct. But they legalized it. Right. And, uh, and s certain civil liberties were granted to, to Roman Catholics mm -hmm. uh, uh, in the late 1820s, early 1830s. And Newman, Newman was very conservative. He was a Tory, and he was uh, very opposed to these developments. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was in part that, uh, that opposition that he felt was dangerous to the church of his birth uh, that he became uh, one of the leaders of, of, uh, of what became known as the Oxford Movement okay. uh, in 1833. And the Oxford Movement was what? What, what characterized it? The Oxford Movement was a, uh, was a movement that, that sought to, uh, to bring the Church of England uh, back to what they understood to be a more Catholic understanding of the nature of that church, mm -hmm. uh, one that, that, was, uh, that was focused more on, uh, on scripture and patristic teaching, Mm -hmm. uh, and by uh, patristic teaching, what does that mean? Oh, the writings of, of, uh, of theologians from the first uh, five, six centuries of mm -hmm. Christianity. And in fact, one of the great services 
that the Oxford Movement did was to translate a lot of those works into English. Correct. Yes, uh, it was a, uh, but also it was a, it was an effort to uh, t to identify a way of thinking about uh, about the uh, the life of the English Church that was much more sacramental. Uh, that uh, they introduced a concept uh, to the English Church, uh, a concept of sacrificial priesthood mm -hmm. uh, that had been largely neglected. Uh, in neglected. It was rejected. Rejected explicitly <laughs> yeah. uh, and revived by, by the Oxford Movement. Yeah, I think at the coronation of King Edward, the son of Henry, right. was that Edward the... <clears throat> Edward the Sixth. Sixth, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, at his coronation mass, they did the mass, but they skipped over the consecration mm -hmm. specifically to not have sacrificial understanding of priesthood. And it was, and it was during the, the, uh, uh, the period of Edward VI that, that all references to sacrificial priesthood were removed from mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the rubrics of, of ordination ceremonies. So they're, they're bringing that back as they saw it in mm -hmm. the fathers of the church. Right, exactly. They saw that the mass is a sacrifice. The fathers all you know clearly taught that the Mass was a sacrifice. Correct. And the real presence. There's not a single father of the church that rejected it. They all teach it. Correct. So this was something that was very much awakening, but it sounds like it could be something that would lead a person like him to become a Catholic. Well, that, and that was, that, was the, uh, uh, that was the struggle, because as the Oxford Movement progressed in the uh, latter part of the 1830s, uh, he, he and others uh, became uh, objects of, uh, of criticism uh, because they were assumed to, to be deeply influenced, if not uh, influenced by Roman Catholics, if not crypto-Catholics in, mm -hmm. some, in some sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, Newman himself began to struggle with the dissonance between what the bishops were saying, the Anglican bishops were saying, and what he and his uh, uh, his fellow Tractarians, uh, uh, members of what the What do you Oxford. mean by Tractarians? Ah, is well, this a new denomination? I don't think I've ever met a member who no, belongs. No, no. Uh, the, the, the tracts for the times were something that, 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 uh, that Newman and several other members of the Oxford Movement instigated to really propagate their ideas. And the, the, their idea was that, that these were to be um, uh, loosely affiliated, uh, uh, lightly edited uh, works that would be circulated widely throughout the Church of England. Sort of like blogs. Yes, an early, an, an early right. form of mm -hmm. that, absolutely. Yeah, so that you know, it would be something you could read in a relatively short amount of time, concise, but might get you to start thinking about longer books. They, they, they began as, as short pieces and they, they became much, much longer towards, uh -huh. towards the end of, yeah. of that period, yeah. So, so this was a, a process that he thought that he was going to help to correct, you know, what the, the, the watered down version of the faith from the Anglican bishops. Right, and, and uh, at one critical point, uh, he published a work uh, uh, that was known as Tract 90, <clears throat> that really definitively uh, uh, created a break uh, uh, between uh, him and the uh, and the Anglican bishops. Mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, he he argued for a an interpretation of the Thirty Nine Articles. That uh, the really, Thirty Nine Articles are what the Thirty Nine Articles were the uh, the Reformation summary of, of the faith according to the, uh, the English reformers. And these 39 articles of faith were put into every book of common prayer. Correct, yes. That, so that Anglicans who went to church on Sunday and had this book of common prayer, which was their standard prayer book, right. would have those 39 articles of faith. If you're interested, you can get them online and, right. and look at them. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, uh, so, but, but, but Newman's uh, interpretation of the 39 articles and, and his way of reading them in a Catholic sense so offended the, uh, the, uh, the English bishops and uh, much, of the, much of the Anglican uh, laity in the popular press that, uh, that he was really quite taken aback.
Mm -hmm. And it led to a period of, uh, of real introspection. Ultimately, he, uh, uh, he retreated to a small village outside of Oxford called Littlemore. And he and a group of young disciples uh, uh, spent a period of almost five years uh, discerning uh, the next step that they should take. Uh, and it's good to keep in mind he was an ordained Anglican priest. Correct, yes. So his difficulty with the bishops was also difficulty with those who were employing him. Right, right. And, uh, and, and so, so he, he found himself by 1843 trying to think of a way forward. And, uh, and uh, one of his uh, sermons during that time really uh, encapsulated some of what he was hoping uh, to use as a justification for his next step. And that was a, a sermon uh, on a, a theory of doctrinal development. Okay, so uh, this idea of the development of doctrine. Right. What does that mean? <laughs> because some people will say, well, a doctrine develops and you can uh, you know, change it any way you want. I mean, there are people out there today who uh, you know, tried to change. I had a caller today that saying that their priest said that now we don't believe in mortal sin anymore. Would that be a development of doctrine? Uh, not, not in Newman's understanding. Yes. Uh, what, what Newman? And, a, and it'd be a heretical development. It would, yes, but yes. it would not be. It would be. A, it would be what Newman would call a false development. Yes. Right. Yes. Now, uh, what what Newman uh, was struggling with was uh, the fact that there were two dominant ways of thinking about history and the Christian past. Uh, one was uh, of of the Christian past. That, uh, that identified in antiquity a, a body of doctrine that, uh, that had remained unchanged uh, through the entire period of, of uh, the, the history of, of Christianity. And some people would try to say, look, this is what the first century church believed. Right. This is how they worship, and this is how they have to worship every century after that. Correct, yes. And that would be, that was one of the attractive ideas of the Protestant reformers right. in the 16th century. Well, and, and what Newman uh, had tried to argue uh, uh, during the Oxford movement was that Protestantism had, uh, had been an innovator. Roman Catholicism had corrupted the faith through the centuries. And it was Anglicanism, that middle way, the via media, that had uh, retained uh, faithful to that original deposit of faith. That was the argument that he mm -hmm. made. Mm -hmm. uh, during the Oxford movement. Uh, the other dominant way of thinking about the Christian past was one that, that became quite well known and articulated during the Protestant Reformation, and that was the notion that, that there was a, uh, a pristine character to the primitive church that had been lost, had been corrupted, and that it was the Protestant reformers who had brought it back and, and restored it to its original intent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Newman was stuck between these two ways of looking at the Christian past. Uh, his theory of development, a sense that, uh, an, uh, a sense that, that uh, there was a nascent body of understanding the faith that existed from antiquity, but that like an infant, it grows and matures and comes of age uh, over a period of time mm -hmm. in the life of the church. Uh, it was that awareness that uh, began to enable him to begin to think about and uh, grow comfortable with the idea that he should become a Roman Catholic. And I think it's important to understand that growth and development is not always good. For instance, when a child is growing, mm -hmm. he starts off with arms, legs, face, hands, and so on, torso, mm -hmm. and those grow in a certain way. But another kind of growth that occurs mm -hmm. is when somebody gets cancer, right. which is a rapid growth that destroys sure. the person right. and, and kills them if right. left un unchecked. Right. And that's what we, we have to try to understand. Right. There are developments of doctrine where it, you can tell, just like you have with a, a baby, say, oh yeah, when you see him as an adult, 
you see the same characteristics. Right. You know, but if there is a cancerous growth in the case, say, of uh, heresy and falsehood, right. it destroys right. that right. group. And as, well, and that and that's the reason why in the larger work that Newman uh, created uh, in 1844 and 1845, just before he became a Roman Catholic, his essay on the development of Christian doctrine, an essay that was over 500 pages long, I, I, he, he I, redefined essay. <laughs> I, he, uh, he identified what he called uh, 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 notes of true development. Mm -hmm. uh, to distinguish it from what he considered to be false development. Mm -hmm. uh, do, you, do you have any, a, a couple quick notes of true development versus false? Well, let me, uh, well, let, let, let me point to something that, that actually happened after his conversion to give you an idea of, of, a, of an aspect of, of, uh, of true development uh, as, as Newman came to understand it, mm -hmm. and as it began to be received very early on in the life of the Catholic Church. Uh, Newman uh, arrived in, in Rome in 1846 uh, to do about a year of studies, not quite a year. And, uh, and he, uh, his, his essay on development was already a stir in, among theologians in, uh, in Rome. Uh, Giovanni Perone, uh, um, Masio, uh, Jesuits like yeah. yourself, uh, and uh, and and they were uh, they were already uh, struggling with a question uh, about the definability of the Immaculate Conception, right? And because uh, that was going to be defined in 1854, 54. but they were talking about it by by uh, 1845, 1846. Mm -hmm. But there was some concern because there wasn't didn't seem to be a way forward to argue for. For, uh, for the uh, dogmatic definition of this dogma. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Newman's theory, uh, along with ideas that were gleaned from, uh, from a German theologian, uh, Johann, Johann Adam Moller, mm -hmm. uh, and a few others from the Tübingen Catholic Theology Faculty, mm -hmm. uh, became a, a way of thinking through uh, the definability of that dogma. By seeing it as a development Correct. and not that, that change that is consistent with the roots, right. going back to scripture, is authentic development. Exactly. And this helped them to see that even though it's a late doctrine, right. a late dogma, it, Emerging in its mature form, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it nevertheless was something that that, uh, that that had had its genesis in nascent teaching in, in the uh, in in the ancient church, uh, and uh, became a part of, of of the living experience of of the of the church in in the nineteenth century. Now, the one of the things that that's really really fascinating about this is that. Uh, uh, another dimension of Newman's uh, thinking, the concept of, of the sense of the faithful, sensus fidelium, mm -hmm. uh, which was already present in his essay on development of doctrine, uh, was something that, that uh, Pope Pius IX actually applied. And in 1849, he sent out a, a request to the bishops of the world uh, to ascertain uh, what the truth uh, or what the consensus might be of the faithful and of the clergy In and of the, the bishops around the world. Because the basis of that theory is, there, the, while some people, uh, small groups can make mistakes mm -hmm. and teach falsehood, right. the whole body of Christ cannot. Right. And as the, the Holy Spirit will not let the whole church go into error, Correct. even though certain parts might, not the whole church. Right, and and so so these two concepts that were very much a part of of Newman's, uh, uh, one would have to say, uh, his effort to uh, to to uh, think his way into the Roman Catholic experience, almost immediately had an impact on the life of the church. Uh, and, the doc and the doctrine was uh, proved by applying both of these principles. Correct. Development of doctrine as well as 
consulting the sense of the faithful. Right. Now, here's where one of the, the difficulties comes in, because a number of theologians have said, well, the faithful have said that it's okay, they think it's okay to go along with, say, contraception. Mm -hmm. That was an argument right. made. It was an argument made in the late, late 1960s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, the late 1960s. Mm -hmm. But they forgot one thing. They, they, none of them were from Chicago. Explain, Father. Well, you see, in Chicago, we don't believe that death takes away your right to vote. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so one of the things that's also an element is with the sense of the faithful, is there a consistency right. going back to the past? Right. The people of the past right. also have a vote right. in terms of the sense of the faithful. And, and the, the argument against uh, a development in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the study that was made of, of, the, uh, of, of contraception had to do with, with the emergence of this as a, as a new and, and um, previously uh, 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 undisputed issue in, uh, among, among Catholic moral theologians and, right. and theologians more generally. Because, you know, to, you know all through history, the church had rejected, the theologians had rejected contraception. Martin Luther, John Calvin, mm -hmm. the Protestants and the Orthodox, everybody rejected it. So the whole of the past was against it until uh, the Anglicans changed their doctrine. In the 1930s. In the 1930s. Correct. Mm -hmm. And then the other churches followed them, but that's looking at the present as the only one who has any vote and that that vote undid the faith of the past. Right, right. And so that, that also had to be brought into play. Sure, sure. You know, the, um, so that's... A, so you're, 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 you're actually articulating uh, how into the 20th century after the council, which was deeply influenced by, by John Henry Newman, uh, his ideas almost immediately became uh, a, 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 a source of appeal on many different uh, subjects mm -hmm. uh, and uh, but I think I think the the thing that would be I would want to emphasize is that that uh, uh, in the immediate wake of the Second Vatican Council, um, at that time Professor Cardinal uh, Joseph Ratzinger uh, uh, was making the point that 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 Newman offered us a way to think about doctrine historically, mm -hmm. and uh, and that that Catholics need not be. Uh, anxious or fearful of, uh, of historical investigation of doctrinal issues. See, that's exactly yeah. it. And, you know, it, it's the, some folks today who, who would like to do in the church what, say, we see in the, our government with the Supreme Court, that even though the laws will all say one thing mm -hmm. all around the country, that gets undone by the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say abortion, you know, right. where it was always voted down by the people. And people say, well, the Pope can just change it. Just have a vote, change it. They said, no, we have to consult the past. Right. And, and the Popes don't have that kind of autocratic dictatorial right. policy. Right. Even though they accuse the Pope of being dictatorial, they want him to be dictatorial mm. for their agenda, right. right? But not for the agenda of Christ mm. and His Church. Mm. And that's one of the things we have to keep strongly in mind about the development of doctrine Correct. in the sense of the faithful. Right. We also have to keep in mind that we have to take a break. Oh my goodness! So we uh, will do that right now, and we want to. Uh, have you call in with your questions and comments, and we'll see what our studio audience has in mind. So please stay with us.
Thank you. Uh, also, I want to mention, somebody said to me, um, wait a minute. In the gospel today, Jesus said to wash your face and to not look like you're fasting. And so how come you Catholics have ashes on? Well, it's not to show that we're fasting. We smile about that, right? We're happy that we're fasting. The ashes are to remind us we're going to die. <laughs> and so, uh, and you can't avoid it. Uh, no matter how much Botox, no matter how much they pull back your skin and make you unable to do anything but smile one way. <laughs> Have you seen some of those people? You know, they get into Hollywood and politics. They can't move their face. They'll crack. <laughs> um, that's just, they're still going to die. And so, and so we put the ashes on that all the makeup and all that can't hide the fact you're going to die because at your, uh, uh, you are dust and unto dust you shall return. So the fasting, keep that a secret. But the fact you're going to die, advertise. Um, now, something else we want to advertise is that we'd love to have you come down here like these nice people have come, most of the, mostly from Florida. They've come here to visit, and we'd love to have you do the same. Whether there's a group like they have come, or a few folks here have come as couples and individuals, just contact our pilgrimage department, and you can call them at 205-271-2966, or you can go to EWTN.com, and they'll give you information on uh, where you can, well, the scheduling of the masses and programs, of course, but also places to stay and eat and directions to get up to Hansful. So you can go up to the beautiful shrine of the Most Blessed Sacrament and take time to pray with the sisters. So we'd love to have you. Also want to make mention uh, that Dr. Parker is the you know, acting head of this uh, group called the National Institute for Newman Studies. Cardinal Newman wrote a lot, a lot. And you can find out more about what they have available by going to their website, which is thenewmaninstitute.org. Thenewmaninstitute.org. And their phone number is 412-681-4375. And I'd be glad to get you information. Plus, they have a website because they are right now in the effort, it's an ongoing effort, to compile a digitized archive of Newman's writings. So all of his books, you'll be able to get downloaded into your computer. Mm -hmm. And it'll be, uh, you can go to Newman Archive. Uh, dot wordpress.com newmanarchive.wordpress.com and the tremendous things uh, one of the people who works here at, at the network was saying to me a little bit earlier that he loves reading these things because it's easy to understand they're very accessible there's also a website for the written works the stuff that's in book form and that is called newmanreader.org. Newmanreader.org. A lot of his stuff is still in print. So that's what I'm going to do. You ready for some questions? Absolutely. Let's start off with <clears throat> Carl. Carl, where are you calling from? Oh, Father, uh, good evening. I'm calling from Duluth, Georgia. Good to have you. Thank you for calling. And what is your question? Well, I, I was reading and I noticed that... Um, after uh, Newman converted to Catholicism, he was ordained a priest in the Catholic Church, and he was later elevated to cardinal in the Catholic Church, but he was never a bishop, never a bishop. So yeah. my question is, why wasn't he a bishop? Yeah, what's up with that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I, I, I think uh, we have to start with the fact that, that Newman resisted the idea uh, he didn't want to. No, no. I, I, he, he was a religious. He was an oratorian. And uh, I, he, he uh, loved his life uh, in the oratory. 
uh, uh, doing his studies, uh, living with his brother priests, uh, and, uh, and also working at the school that he founded, mm -hmm. St. Philip's School. And it's maybe worth noting that uh, John Cardinal Dulles, right. a Jesuit right. who was made a cardinal, also asked not to be made a bishop. Right. He remained a cardinal priest. Right. Now, he would have had the right to vote for a pope. Right. Cardinals are electors right. for the papacy, but they don't have to be bishops. Most of them are. Right. Uh, they're also cardinal deacons, so you know, there are different levels that you can be. Right. Well, and uh, uh, because Newman, I, one, one might argue that because Newman uh, uh, was made a cardinal by, by Leo XIII, uh, and died before Leo XIII's uh, reign as, as uh, uh, pontiff uh, uh, ended. Mm -hmm. uh, he never had that opportunity. No, he didn't. No. He didn't get to go uh, vote for correct. the new pope uh, because the, uh, Leo lived longer than he did. That's correct. Uh, oddly, too, because uh, Pope Leo XIII was kind of old and a little bit sickly. Right. And they thought, well, this would be an interim pope, and he ended up living a fairly long time. Exactly. And, uh, and did some tremendous things. Yes. Yeah. So, take another call. We have Ed. Hello, Ed? Yeah, good evening, Father. Hi, where are you calling from? I'm calling from Wisconsin, the northeast part. Great, good to have you. And uh, a little chilly up there? Yeah, a little chilly, uh, quite a few inches of snow today, and extremely slick. Ooh, okay, well, I'll be careful about that. So, uh, what is your question, Ed? I've been uh, very much uh, interested in watching the show, and I thought maybe I could uh, uh, come speak forward with a little bit of a comment that uh, you and the guest are, are, are touching on quite well, but I'd like to maybe uh, say it just a little bit differently. And mm -hmm. What you're touching on is called the analogy of faith. Uh, mm -hmm. This is sometimes politely referred to as a three-legged stool, and what basically means is that in the development of doctrine, the doctrine must harmonize with sacred scripture, tradition, and magisterial teaching. Yes. And if it doesn't, then it's, it's a very questionable development or teaching that, that's being proffered or put forward. And Ed, I'll, just, I'll just hang up and let you Ed, expand very, on that. Very, very important because, uh, uh, again, the three-legged stool right. that has to be in scripture, right. in sacred tradition, right. which is the tradition going back to the apostles. Right. And then the magisterium, that is the official teaching of the church, papal teaching, councils, et cetera. Right, right. So um, you want to add any of that? Well, That's an important insight. It is, and, and it actually touches on, on a, a, a dimension of, of uh, something that's, uh, that's in the process of being considered, uh, uh, because that point, uh, the ecclesial sources for teaching, is actually one criteria uh, that's applied in consideration of, of uh, naming a person a doctor of the church. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so one can argue that uh, one of the justifications for Newman ultimately becoming a doctor of the church has to do with the fact that his teaching uh, was grounded in scripture, uh, was faithful to, uh, to sacred tradition, uh, and that it conformed, uh, not only conformed, but helped inform magisterial teaching, mm -hmm. uh, uh, beginning with the, uh, with the pontificate of, of Pius IX. And, you know, to see, uh, as Ed said, these are uh, like a three-legged stool uh, which is more secure than a two-legged or one-legged monopod because it's grounded in those three sources. Right. And that, that's a, a very important element. And Newman was brilliant when he wrote about the Arian heresy in yes. the fourth century, showing that as well as the sense of the faithful. Right. You know, uh, when the bishops became heretics, the faithful did not. And, and that, that was actually a, a point of controversy uh, in the late 1850s uh, when, he, when he wrote his uh, uh, essay on consulting the faithful in matters of doctrine. Uh, that was seen as by, by some, uh, 
uh, one bishop in England and certainly several curial officials uh, as being proximate to heresy mm -hmm. because it, it appeared that he was making the argument that, uh, that, uh, uh, that the teachers of the church were consulting the taught uh, in order to determine uh, a correctness of doctrine. But, uh, but Newman uh, argued that, that there's something in the, uh, the harmony and accord between the pastors uh, and the, and and the, the people and mm -hmm. the flock that's not in the pastors alone. Mm -hmm. And so it gets to this point that, that, uh, that Newman was arguing about Arians uh, in the fourth century, uh, to have bishops who were Arians and uh, the laity who were faithful to, to an orthodox understanding of the and faith. At one point uh, in the Eastern Church, 85% oh, yes. of the bishops were That's Arian right. heretics. That's correct. Denying the divinity of Christ. In the Western Church, no. Right. But in the Eastern Church, yeah. Yes. So, and, but the people weren't, and they brought their pastors back. Right. It's a great, great book. Yes. We have uh, Nancy on the line. Hello, Nancy. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Topeka, Kansas. Yes, ma'am. And what is your question or comment? Well, I just don't understand why you have to go back in history to see what other people, especially lay people, have to say about doctrine and, and not tie it in with what Jesus taught. I, I never hear anybody say, well, this is where it is in the Bible. This is what we based it on. Mm -hmm. And I don't get that. I mean, why is it not done that way? Wait, wait, you, you never hear anybody ground our doctrine in Scripture? Well, not when you get into the technical issues of it and you hear all the bishops talking about it and stuff like that. Now, when you teach a course, then yes, you do. Mm -hmm. but, you better but believe I do. The, yes. <laughs> but, <laughs> but when, like, in, even in the catechism, there's no Scripture reference for a lot of the stuff that's taught in there. And I don't understand why not. Okay, well, first of all, I'm going to disagree with you on that because there are a lot of Scripture references throughout the Catechism. But, but we'll address your question because it's an important question. You know, why, uh, why do we do that? And again, like the last question, it's a three-legged stool. Right. But let's take a look at this. Well, I, 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 the, the issue of... Uh, 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 of scripture as opposed to tradition uh, is something that is a dichotomy that that emerged in uh, in the uh, in the early modern period during the Reformation, uh, and that even actually a little before with right. William of Ockham. Yes, yeah. and the, the 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 tendency to uh, certainly in, uh, among many Protestants to see a scripture and scripture alone as the source for uh, for teaching. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the church, and uh, the the the, uh, the Council of Trent, and uh, certainly those who taught following that, uh, recognized that there's a, that that there's an uh, an inextricable connection between scripture and tradition, mm -hmm. and in fact, one one could argue, should argue, I th I think, that that scripture emerged from the early tradition of the church. As we, well as Scripture itself saying in Second Thessalonians chapter two verse fifteen, hold on to the traditions which I left you, right. whether by word or by letter. Right. So the Bible teaches Scripture and tradition, right, and not Scripture alone. That's never in the Bible, right. right. Again, it's not it's not taught anywhere until William of Ockham teaches it right. in the. Uh, uh, 14th century. It's always it's always very important to recognize that 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 we didn't have the canon of scripture that we that we have today until uh, 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 fourth uh, well 382 with yeah. the Synod of Rome That's and correct. then the Synod of uh, Carthage and Hippo right in the, 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 the first list that we that we see was uh, that 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 outlined that the the canon that we have today. Uh, was was created by Athanasius. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's uh, it's um, but but in terms of consulting with the past, here's one of the reasons, Nancy. Too, I think that we mm -hmm. uh, to address part of that question right. is that when you look at the Arian heresy, mm -hmm. for instance, 
what you see is that the Arian heretics were using Scripture alone right. to prove that Jesus is not God the Son. Right. And the uh, St. Athanasius, whom right. you just mentioned, right. was using Scripture and right. the tradition right. and the decisions of the bishops and popes before that. Correct. So he was using all of it, the Arian heretics, not unlike the Jehovah's Witnesses today who are Arian heretics. Mm -hmm. They go around saying that it's the Bible only and they use the Bible to prove Jesus is not God. Right. But it was that combination of Scripture, magisterium, and tradition. Right. Again, Ed's three-legged stool that, um, you know, they know about three-legged stools up there in Wisconsin because <laughs> they have all those cows and they make I all guess. that cheese. They're squeezing away. Yes. So, uh, but that's, that's where that is. So, you know, all of us have to use Scripture right. in tradition. And the catechism was very good on that. Right, right. We have another question? Sure. Start off with Robert. Hello, Robert. Yeah, hello, Father Mitch. Hi, where are you from? Massachusetts, Sigby Falls, Massachusetts, to be Good. exact. Well, I like exactness. What is your question? Well, I was wondering, did Cardinal Newman or did he attend the first Vatican Council? Good question. Ah, uh, actually, he was invited uh, to to be a consulting theologian by by several bishops and uh, even the Pope himself. Mm -hmm. uh, Newman chose to remain in Birmingham, England. Uh, to, uh, to finish work on, on a book uh, that's uh, proven to be uh, extremely important uh, for, for the, the Catholic Church since its appearance, called The Grammar of Ascent. Yes. Uh, and, but but Newman, Newman was, uh, was not, his influence was not absent. He, mm -hmm. he, was, uh, uh, he was in correspondence with bishops who were at the First Vatican Council. Yeah, so he'd write them letters back and forth. Yes. But he did not attend. That's correct, yes. Yeah. yeah. And, it, you know, the First Vatican Council was shortened because there was a war between, uh, you know, Prussia had invaded France. And yes. And the French were protecting the Papal States. Right. From the Italian nationalists. From the Italian nationalists. Right. So... Um, you know, once the French protectors were gone, right. then the, the bishops scattered because it became right. very dangerous to be in Rome. So, so the First Vatican Council was not closed until the beginning of the Second Vatican Council. That's right. A, a hundred years later, almost a hundred years later. Yeah, explain that a little bit more fully. That well, the, the, uh, the, the assumption was that, that, uh, that when there was peace or when it was uh, safe again, uh, that the bishops would reconvene and finish the work of the First Vatican Council. Uh, it was really a truncated council. Uh, only the beginnings of, of, the, of, of the teachings that, that were planned to mm -hmm. be promulgated uh, actually uh, uh, were, were brought to the council and uh, voted on by the council fathers. So they dealt with papal infallibility. Right. But they didn't get to the second part, which was the roles of the College of Bishops. Right. And right. They, they, Vatican II dealt with that. Yes, yes. We have another call. Hello, Mike. Hello, hi. Hi, where are you from? Hi, I'm, I'm from Chicago. Oh, aren't you something? See, yeah, uh, you knew was I father, wrong uh, about uh, the dead people voting? <laughs> <laughs> uh, only in the Catholic Church. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, remember, I live there. But go on, Mike, what's your question? I, uh, you knew my you knew my dad, uh, Deacon Frank Duffy. Oh yeah, Iowa. sure. Oh, that's yeah. that, well nice to to have you uh, calling in, Mike. So, what's okay. your question? I have a real quick question. Uh, I'm going to ask the guest. Um, does he know of any relationship between Hilaire Belloc and Cardinal Newman? So, was there any connection or relation between Hilaire Belloc and Cardinal Newman? That's that's something that I I'm not aware of. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't mean that, that there wasn't, but, uh, but I'm, not, I'm not aware of a connection between the two. Because Belloc might have still been living in France. It's, it's, it's possible. When, when uh, Newman was still al was alive in England. I don't know when Belloc moved to England. Right. 
uh, and Chesterton, who was Belloc's friend, uh, had not yet converted. Right. He, right. Wasn't, he wasn't anywhere close to conversion. Sure. Um, he didn't convert till the 1920s. Right. So I, I, don't, I don't have a definitive answer on that, uh, uh, but uh, it's, a, it's, an, it's an interesting question to clarify. But it does bring out an important thing, how a number of very important converts like Newman and Chesterton right. had a huge impact on the church to this day. We still read Chesterton too. Right, exactly. No, I, 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 th I think the, the thing uh, that we need to be mindful of, especially about those who, who became influential writers in the late 19th and early 20th century, uh, uh, were deeply steeped in Newman's writings. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, in one way or another, uh, synthesized and applied and expanded upon his ideas. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, to the point uh, that uh, they were seen to be uh, a bit dangerous uh, uh, to, uh, to the uh, life of the church. Uh, that's, that, that's part of the background for what became known as the, uh, as the modernist controversy, mm -hmm. the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, but but uh, a more nuanced application of, of Newman's ideas of development and, and other, uh, other key concepts uh, began to be explored uh, uh, in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. And it's those theologians who are known as the race or small theologians, the, the resourcing theologians, mm -hmm. uh, who became... Um, um, uh, very important and, and vital uh, uh, background for, for what uh, happened at the Second Vatican Council. And, and I think it's important to note that what we now call the modernist heresy, mm -hmm. that it started in the 19th, late 19th century and moved to the 20th, right. that was an example of a development gone wrong. That became a cancerous development. It, it, was, it, it, was, it was seen as, a, as, a, as a taking Newman's theory of development too far. And uh, when you take any growth too far, right. that's when it becomes cancerous and destructive. And, and, it, it, and actually, uh, one, of the, one of the great concerns uh, when the uh, when the modernists were condemned, and two of, two of them, two famous ones, were were excommunicated, uh, uh, the question was uh, arose: They're so influenced by Newman, does this condemnation condemn Cardinal Newman as well? And the Pope came out and uh, and was definitive that that Newman's ideas about development uh, uh, remained orthodox and within the tradition. Right. Yeah. Whereas the, their notion of development said, oh, we can get rid of some of this stuff that we don't think is modern right. and we'll define what's modern and modernity will keep redefining. And when you do that, you end up, you know, seeing babies going out with all kinds of bathwater. Mm. Yeah, we want to encourage you to go to the National Institute of Newman Studies. Their website is the Newman Institute.org. You can also call them for more information at 412 681 4375 and find out more about it and look up more about the uh, writings that are coming online in mm. digital form. Dr. Parker, thank you very much for being with us. I think you helped show how important Cardinal Newman is, blessed Cardinal Newman, and uh, to the Vatican II and to our own thinking today right. about the, and and a good correctives that we needed um, in the last hundred years and will continue to need as right. well. I want to thank you too. So may the Almighty God bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And you know that we can bring you this program and all the other programs we get to do only because Mother Angelica set this up so that this network would be brought to you by you, not by advertising and such as that. So we ask you to please continue to remember to keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill because we get a lot of bills too and they want us to pay them. 
so your help makes it possible for us to do so. God bless you and thank you.